welcome everyone to New Life Church. Welcome to Sunday School this morning. Let's all stand. Let's welcome his presence into this place today. Jesus, we worship you. God, we praise your holy name. God, we welcome you here in this place, Jesus. God, we worship your holy name. God, we give you all praise. We give you all glory. We give you all honor today. God, you are great and greatly to be praised. In the name of Jesus, we worship you. Hallelujah, Jesus.
precious blood. We love you, Jesus. God, thank you for paying the price for our sins. We love you, Jesus. God, thank you for coming down from your throne in glory to pay the price for me. We love you, Jesus. God, you're holy. God, you're wonderful. You're mighty. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 There's something wonderful about knowing how to worship through a song. We don't just sing. We worship and we connect in that. And just in a few moments of talking about how great our Savior is, we can connect with Him and the world just seems to melt away as we fall into His presence once again. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sunday School. I'm so glad to have you. Those of you online, thank you for joining us. Please like, share, comment, subscribe. If you haven't in the room yet got on the Facebook page and liked it, please do so. We are trying to reach our world, and you can help by hitting like, by commenting, by sharing. Right? We want to reach our world. It's really easy to hit like. It's really easy to hit share. And the more good content we can put out there about how good Jesus is and how wonderful our church is, the more we can share with our community. Amen. Amen. If you've never done so, text welcome to 440-577-5777. There you go. 577-5777. That's the new church number text. If you have questions, there's a lot of, you know, info, that kind of things. We have a lot of great things going on here. Today's the church picnic. Amen. If you would like to join us and you're like, well, I don't have anything to bring. It's okay. There's tons of food. They started bringing it last night and putting it in the fridges. It smells delicious. You're more than welcome to come. Even if you're online, like, well, I've never been to this church before. Come to the picnic. We have a great time. We have a lot of fun. We're going to play kickball at, as adults. We're going to play some kickball. It's going to be a lot of fun. Amen. And as our ushers come, they're going to wait on you this morning. I know we talked a little bit about this last week, but we know that there's a blessing in giving. And it seems like, oh, they, we always say this because every week there's something new. How many of you were blessed this week financially? God just took care of something. Maybe you just found gas 50 cents cheaper than you normally do. Right? That goes a long way nowadays. I got a 26-gallon tank. 50 cents off is a big help. Amen. Let's pray over this offering. Dear Jesus, God, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. God, we thank you for everything that you're doing for us. God, we thank you for this church. We thank you for our pastor. God, bless this offering. Use it for your kingdom. God, we already know that you're blessing and taking care of us, but we want you to know this morning that we're thankful, and that we're going to continue to trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I have the wonderful honor to get to introduce Sister Thompson this morning. She's going to be teaching this class. I am excited to hear from her. You may be seated. Everybody ought to go to Sunday school. I'm glad you're here today. It's important. It's important. Sunday school is important. We can get deep into some things that we can't always do in the second service. That's funny because our pastor gets deep into everything. I appreciate the man of God in my life who teaches me things. We, as a church, sometimes don't realize how blessed we are to have a pastor that teaches truth and who goes deep into some things. I, I talk to other people at other churches, and they're like, well, we never heard that. I'm like, well, it's in the Bible. Doesn't your pastor teach that? <laughs> no. I'm like, well, it's in there. Find you, find you a pastor that's going to teach you truth. I'm glad we have a pastor that teaches us truth. Amen? Amen? All right, well, let's get right into our lesson today. The timer is ticking. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 through 16. Um, Brother Cecil, I think everything's in there. If not, I apologize. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice 
of praise to God. We know what continual means. That's constant. It's gone on and on and on. And then sacrifice. Sacrifice. Proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. These are the sacrifices that please God. What is the meaning of the word sacrifice? Sometimes we, we think we know. Um, it, the dictionary says to, to offer a sacrifice, to suffer loss, give up, renounce, to destroy, especially for an ideal belief or an end, or to sell at a loss. It's when you lose something, when you give up something, when you sacrifice something. So it says through Jesus, we need to continually be giving up something. Continually giving up something as a sacrifice to him who made the ultimate sacrifice. So put that note right there, post-it note to your brain. And we're going to go to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24. And I'm going to quickly read this chapter. I believe it's up there. I think it's in the NLT. So if you have a different version, it might read a little differently. But let's, let's go through this. Once again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he caused David to harm them by taking a census. Go and count the people of Israel and Judah, the Lord told him. So the king said to Joab and the commander of the army, take a census of all the tribe of Israel, from Dan in the north through Bathsheba in the south, so that I may know how many people there are. But Joab replied to the king, may the Lord your God let you live to see a hundred times as many people as there are now. But why, my lord the king, do you want to do this? Why do you want to do this? But the king insisted that they take the census. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out to the count the people of Israel. First they crossed the Jordan and camped it at Aor, south of the town of the valley of the direction of Gad. And they went to Jazar, then to Gilead, the town of, yep, T-H. And then they went to D-J, around to Sidon. And they came to the fortress of Tyre and all the towns of the Hivites and the Canaanites, Finally, they went south of Judah as far as Bathsheba. Having gone through the entire land for nine months and 20 days, they returned to Jerusalem. Joab reported the number of people to the king. There were 800,000 capable warriors in Israel who could handle a sword and 500,000 in Judah. But after he had taken the census, David's conscience began to bother him. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly by taking this census. Please forgive my guilt, Lord, for doing this foolish thing. The next morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet of Gad, who was David's seer. And this was the message. Go say to David, this is what the Lord says. I will give you three choices. Choose one of these three punishments, and I'm going to inflict it upon you. So Gad came to David and said, will you choose three years of famine throughout your land, three months of fleeing from your enemies, or three days of severe plague throughout your land? Think it over and decide what the answer I should give the Lord who sent me. He was given three choices. What punishment do you want for your sin? Verse 14, I'm in a desperate situation, David replied, but let us Fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. Don't let me fall into human hands. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel that morning, and it lasted for three days. A total of 70,000 people died throughout the nation, from Dan in the north to Bathsheba in the south. But as the angel was preparing to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord relented and said to the death angel, Stop, that's enough. And at that moment, the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arunah, the Jebusite. And when David saw the angel, he said to the Lord, I am the one who has sinned and done wrong. But these people are innocent as sheep. Why have, what have they done? Let your anger fall against me and my family. That's a really good verse when you're talking to people about, well, it's my body, my choice, I can do what I want. Your sin affects other people. 70,000 people paid for David's sin. Your choices, what you do, is not just about you. Generations after you, your children and your children's children will suffer from the choices that you make. Well, I can do what I want. Yeah, maybe. 
You may be over 18 and on your own and can do what you want, but the fact of the matter is th God doesn't forget. He knows. And even if that, he may forgive you, but there's always consequences. Always consequences. Verse 18, that day Gad came to David and said to him, go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arunah the Jebusite. So David went up to do what the Lord had commanded him. And when Arunah saw the king and his men coming toward him, he came and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Why have you come, my lord, Arunah asked. David replied, I have come to buy your threshing floor and to build an altar to the Lord here so that he will stop this plague. Take it. You, you, you can have it. Do it as you wish with it. And Arunah said to David, here's oxen for the burnt offering. You can use the threshing board and the ox yokes for wood to build a fire to the altar. I will just give it to you, my king. You, you can have it, and may the Lord accept, accept your sacrifice. Verse 24, but King David replied, no. I insist on buying it, for I will not present a burnt offering to the Lord my God that has cost me nothing. So David paid him 50 pieces of silver for the threshing and the oxen. And David built an altar to the Lord and sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the Lord answered his prayer for the land, and the plague of Israel was stopped. Now we have to understand something. Israel obeyed God, and when they obeyed God, the blessings came. And when they disobeyed God, there was a curse. They obeyed God, and it was a circle. It just kept happening. If you study the history, they, when they were obedient, they had plenty. When they were disobedient, they didn't have. Sacrifice and worship. Sacrifice and worship. The Bible says, you know, we lift up holy hands like the evening sacrifice. But when you think about the sacrifice that Jesus made on Calvary, that seems like a small thing. Some of the things he's wanting us to sacrifice is our own will and desires to sin. It's in us. And we can look at a lot of things. You know, we, oh, you know, well, I, don't, I don't do this and I don't do that. But we all have things that we have to overcome. We don't talk about gluttony a lot because that's an acceptable sin to Americans. But is that acceptable to God? You know, I, I may not be, you know, an alcoholic and drinker, but sometimes I need to learn to push the plate away. You know, that's why fasting is so important. We've got to get our flesh under control. What are we sacrificing? David said, I can't offer to God something that costs me nothing. You know, I look around the room this morning. I, I sit over here. We, we come into this nice air-conditioned room. We have electricity. When I went in the bathroom, the toilet's flushed. I could wash my hands. We sit here on these comfy chairs. This doesn't feel like much of a sacrifice. Well, I had to get up early and, you know, get dressed and get here. Well, yeah, and when you got here, there was coffee made. <laughs> Where was the sacrifice? I don't believe, and this is just me, that coming to church is truly a real sacrifice. Like, well, you live next door. If I lived an hour away, I still wouldn't believe it was really a sacrifice. Not comparatively to what has been sacrificed for me. There are things that we want to say, well, I sacrificed my two hours on Sunday, and I sacrificed this. We've got to stop and think about what are we really willing to give God? What desires do we have? What are the things that we want to do? And there may be things that we want to do that aren't necessarily sin that we need to give up so that we have time to read our Bible, so we have time to pray every day. You know, well, it's not really a sin to go and do. No, it's not. But are you doing all the other things? When I prayed this morning, I said, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my iniquity. Forgive me of my pride. Forgive me of my selfishness. Forgive me of the things that I thought that weren't true. Forgive me of the words that I spoke that didn't bring you glory. And then I said, Lord, forgive me for not doing the things that are good that I know to do. The sins of omission. Maybe like, well, I was really good today. I haven't sinned at all. It's early. But what did you not do this week that you should have done? Was there a neighbor you should have helped? Was there time in prayer you, you should have taken? Was there scripture you should have read? So we have to think about the sins of omission as well. And David said, I can't offer to God something that didn't cost me anything. I'm going to pay for this sacrifice because I need God to forgive me and stop the plagues. 
Luke 9, 23. You may have it, you may not. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you want to be my followers, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you want to be my followers, you have got to give up your own way. The way that you think is right, the Bible says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. I can't tell you how many times I have thought something, it seemed right, and here's the word, we got to be careful, it felt right. Your feelings are not true. They are deceitful. And you know, as those of you who have lived any length of time, there's been times you've been angry at somebody for no good reason. I don't know why I'm so mad. Well, because your feelings will lie to you. They're real. We need to acknowledge them sometimes. Sometimes we need to control them better, right? They're real. You know, you can't dismiss every feeling, but they're not usually truthful. And he said, if you want to be my follower, you've got to give up your way. What you think is right, how you think you should live. The Bible is clear on what is right and how we should live. There's a way that seems right to me, but the end thereof is death. The word of God is true and forever settled in heaven. But if you're not spending any time, if I'm not spending any time in his word, how do I know what truth is? We are bombarded every day, media, social media, the news, conversations. I, I'm shocked at what, what young people, and I, I work with young people. We have young people who live in strong Christian homes, who come to this Christian school, who leave and in less than six months believe something completely different than they've ever been taught because the world makes it seem so true. Just because a bunch of people who may or may not be educated or seemingly you know, charismatic and smart say something, it doesn't make it true. I could stand here all day long and try to convince you that this carpet is dark green. I could get swatches out. I could bring Sister Steve up here to do a math equation to prove it's true. And you guys might leave her, maybe it is green. Maybe, right? Maybe, but no, there's nobody here foolish enough to believe that. It's red, right? Uh, we'll ask Brother Kurt later. He might know. We need to understand it doesn't matter how good it sounds or what we feel. What matters is what does the word of God say? And when he says you need to take up your cross daily and follow me, that means I have to give up some things that I might hold dear and think is true. A family tradition may be a good idea. But if it's not following truth, it's not okay. My father and my grandfather and my, their family, they were Catholic. They held to a lot of tradition. But some of their traditions did not line up with the word of God. And so I was like, well, you know, I, I, this has been in the family from generation to generation to generation. But my Bible says something different. But if you're not spending time sacrificing your time, oh, there's that word again, in his word, then you're not going to know what truth is. I'm angered by the fact that our young people and young adults are being fed a lie by this world and they're believing it. If you're a young person, I challenge you today. Get in this word and know what it says. Don't just know it in your head. Know it. Have it in your heart. The Bible says if you'll read this word, if you'll study this word, if you'll think about this word, you are guaranteed good success. No one else can guarantee you that. I know college graduates that are penniless. They can't get a decent job. I know people who are very smart, spend a lot of money on education, and they don't have the common sense to rub two nickels together, right? But the word of God guarantees success if we follow it, but you've got to know it. So we talk about sacrifice, something that, that cost us something. And then the word covenant, we're talking about covenant today. A covenant is a solemn and binding agreement. 
is a solemn. When, when two people get married, they are making a covenant between themselves and God for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, and sickness and health, till death do us part. Right? I said, don't make me mad because I can't divorce you. But we got lots of land out there I can put you in. <laughs> and we've had 32 really good years. Isn't that right? <laughs> but we did. When we got married, we said the word divorce is not going to be in our vocabulary because it's until death do us part. He didn't realize it would take so long. <laughs> but I'm still here, baby. But that covenant, it doesn't mean to the world what it's supposed to mean today. Right now, there are people who are, who are growing up and, and, you know, even in their 20s and 30s and even 40s, you know, we're going to get married this time, and if it doesn't work out, we can always find someone else. That can never be the mentality. That's not what a covenant is. In the Bible, if you made a covenant, it wasn't to death. If you couldn't keep your promise, then you're going to die. We don't make a promise before God and just be flippant about it. And the problem is, in our world today, so many people were raised in a family where dad and mom would just say anything to get the kid to be quiet and then do something. Well, you promised. Yeah, well, I changed my mind. We taught them this. We taught them that our promise, our covenant binding agreement didn't mean anything. Now, I know there's circumstances. You know, we promise to go boating and there's a hurricane. I get that. But I tried to be very careful what I promised my children because I wanted them to know if I said it, it was going to be so. Because they needed to learn that they could trust a promise. And a covenant is more than a promise. It is, it is a binding agreement between you and God. When we stand before here and we live in a world where, oh, it doesn't matter. Our young people are taught hooking up is okay. It's not okay. It goes completely against the word of God. Well, I'm not hurting anybody but myself. No, 70,000 people paid the price for David's sin. Well, it, it, who am I affecting? Your future children. Your future grandchildren. Maybe existing family members, and 100% the body of Christ. If you and I choose to go out and live however we want and sin however we want, we are hurting the body of Christ. It's not your choice. It is a covenant that we've come into relationship with God. And because we have been called into a covenant relationship, we have to exercise our privilege of sacrificial living. It's going to cost you something. You're going to have to give up some time. You're going to give up, give up some desires. Well, I really like to do blah, blah, blah. Wonderful. But if it's sin, you need to sacrifice that. You know, I, I say this a lot because I hear different things, you know, when we go different places. You know, they tell young people, especially, don't sin. Don't sin. It's bad. It's bad. And I'm like, the Bible says sin is pleasurable for a season. Let's not give them the wrong impression. But it also says sin ends in death. So all that fun you're having, thinking you're doing okay, will destroy you. And sometimes we have to sacrifice some of that for the, better, the bigger picture. Where do you want to spend eternity? Where do you want to live eternity? Do you want to live it in heaven or live it in hell? You get to choose. You get to choose. I say this a lot. You know, oh, I, I, I want to have my, God doesn't always have my way. God doesn't always get to have his way. He, it's his will that every man would come to repentance. It's his will that we would all love him enough to be obedient to his word. But when we talk about being in a covenant relationship with him and sacrificial living, that means I can't live like act like, dress like, think like, go to the same places as the world goes and thinks I'm keeping my covenant relationship with him. He expects us to carry up our cross every day and follow him. He expects us to living sacrifice. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you 
that I present our bodies a living sacrifice, a sacrifice giving up something for God. That's part of our worship. I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. He doesn't ask unreasonableness for us. And those of us who've lived long enough, we know sin may be fun for a while, but the end of it is destruction. End of it is destruction. Alcohol destroyed my family. My, my, my parents probably didn't realize that when they started out. The price. Sin will take you farther than you ever meant to go. I have watched pornography and different things, and you say, oh, this isn't really pornography. You know what? Some of the things that we don't consider pornography are still pornography. It doesn't have to be grotesque. It can be mild. Your mind will finish it. I've watched people who have destroyed their marriages because of such things. We have got to understand it is our privilege to live a life of sacrifice. We are sacrificing heartache. We are sacrificing physical ailments and sicknesses. Very rarely, and it happens, but very rarely does someone die of lung cancer who didn't smoke. Oh, but it's fun. It calms my nerves. It helps me to lose weight. You can have all the reasons. But the end is not pretty. We have to understand we're going to have to sacrifice some of our wants and our desires to follow him, to follow him. And that covenant agreement is binding. We don't just say, come to the altar in the moment of an emotional time. I'm going to give you my life, Lord. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do what you want. I don't want to just be, you know, a pew warmer. I'm going to be more than just a church member, attendee. I'm going to serve you every day. And then walk away and do whatever we want. We just made a binding agreement with him. We can't say, oh, you know, uh, I changed my mind. It doesn't work that way. 70,000 people paid the price for David's sin. And we've got to understand it's a privilege to sacrifice for him because he gave all for you. Nobody will love you like Jesus loves you. Nobody will accept you the way he accepts you. And when you live according to his plan, he will open heaven up and bless you. Those of us who've lived on the other side can tell you this is a much better choice. This is a much better choice. If you're new or you're watching online and you're new and you haven't made that decision to follow him, follow him. He has all the good stuff. It's not just heaven. There's a, there's a blessing in living for him. Do we still have problems? Yes. Family members still have problems? Absolutely. That's just part of it. We live in a, a fallen world. But I would rather walk through the fire with Jesus than to walk through the fire by myself. I would rather go through the trials and tribulations of this life with him than to try to face it by myself. Sacrificial living. Another area that we talk about, Malachi 3, 8. Do you have that, brother? Malachi 3, 8 through 11. I, don't, I didn't look at my slides before they got done to see if we had them all. This probably isn't. Okay. Will man rob God? Yet you robbed me. But I say, wherein have we robbed you in tithe and offerings? Verse number 9. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove to me wherewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. What does the word tithe mean? 10%. We can't change the definition of the word. It means 10%. 10%. How do we rob God? By not giving our tithe, our 10%. Our 10%. If we give 8% and we write on the envelope that we're giving a tithe, we need to read the story of Anna and I and Sapphira. 
We just need to say that's an offering. But the bare minimum requirement is 10% of our income needs to come back into the storehouse, back into the church. Why? When we do that, he will stop the devourer from devouring our finances. And when we sacrificially give above that, he will bless us with more than we need. There is such a truth in that. We have people that we know that tithe to different ministries or different churches who never go to church. They don't watch online. But they have learned if they give tithe and they, or they pay their tithes, what is the minimum requirement here in this scripture, and they give offering that their blessings just keep coming. It doesn't matter that they're, I mean, you know, financially the, the promise happens whether they go to church or not. And so we know people who are giving and their businesses are being blessed, their families or finances are being blessed because it's a biblical principle. He said, if you will pay your tithes, then I will stop the devourer from devouring you. And as we give that sacrificial offering, you know, we don't talk a lot about tithing here. We talk about giving the building fund, giving the reach fund, giving the this fund, because that's important. That's where the blessings come in. You want the overflow. You cannot give God. He will never owe you something. Oh, you know what? They gave so much. I better give them something. He doesn't owe us. He's going to always bless and take care of. And I can tell you, I've been married for 32 years, and even before that, when I was single, I paid my tithes and I gave my offering. I have obviously never missed a meal unless I wanted to. I've never had to walk out of my house naked. I've never had to sleep on the ground. God has always provided my needs. Always. Sometimes it's slim, you know, hold my breath a little bit, make sure we're going to make those ends meet, but he never failed me. I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. If you're struggling with your finances, reevaluate. Make sure you're, you're doing what the Bible says you need to do and watch God bless it. Watch him bless the fact that you trust him with your finances. Watch it. We, we have friends who own businesses and they, they send their ties to different places because they want their businesses blessed. And I keep saying, you know, you should go to church somewhere. <laughs> but they got this principle and God is blessing them for it. I want the blessings of God in my life. North America is a very self-centered and consumer-driven culture. The thought of being content with the things we have is long gone. America has never seems to have enough. And that may be other countries. I don't know. I haven't been many places. But I find that a lot of times, especially, um, you know, outside the church, but even in the church, I always need a nicer car. I always need to upgrade my house. I always need the nicest gadget. You know, our, our young people are inundated with, you know, I would be happy with a flip phone, but, and this is probably old now comparatively. I don't know. I've had this for a while, but I've got to get the new upgraded phone. Or I've got to get the new, you know, Atari game. That's not what they do now. PlayStation. PS, the ice, Icebox? No. No. I need the best Icebox. Xbox. I got to get updated. I got to get upgraded. My, la my laptop, Brother Bob, I remember when he got me the one I have now, which has been a while because you haven't been here. Hint, hint. He, I'm like, I don't need a new one. He goes, no, you will. I'm like, no, 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 this is fine. And then he got me the new one, which was actually a used one that they refurbished. And I was like, wow, I can really do my work now. <laughs> but we never seem to have enough. We need another outfit, we need another pair of shoes, we need a newer car, we need, we need, we need, we need. We're so discontented with life. And back to my first comment, we need a new spouse. I'm getting tired of this old lady, let me get a new one. Don't ever say that. <laughs> but we're trying to always get more, get more, get more, get better, get better. Young people get married and they want at the beginning of their marriage what their parents have 30 years after being married. We didn't start out with all these things. It took us 30 years to accumulate all this stuff. And so we need to start learning to be content with what we have. 
And in an effort to make the gospel more palatable for pleasure-seeking society, some Christians have cheapened it, and they've misrepresented the sacrificial commitment of the cross. And it's often seen in well-meaning, misguided services. Uh, they call them seeker-friendly or seeker-sensitive churches. But most of today's successful and growing churches are what some call celebrating churches. They just celebrate all the time. They follow the same script as advertisers. Keep the message simple, tie it to emotions, use the power of music to set the mood, make it easy to follow through and protect everyone's anonymity, and finally then ask for a response. But the problem is people are very much turned off by this disingenuous presentation because the gospel becomes like a bait switch. And consumer Christians turn away from it when they realize the cost of discipleship is higher than the price they're willing to pay. When people are not willing to themselves sacrifice, like, well, he made the ultimate sacrifice. He did. He's not asking us to die on a cross. He's asking us to be a living sacrifice, to give up our thoughts and our ways. Jesus made it very clear to his disciples if you desire to come after me, you have to deny yourself, deny your, thought, your desires, your ways, what you want. Take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Stop fulfilling the desires of your flesh. It is a sacrifice. But what we're sacrificing, again, is heartache and death. Well, I want to fit in. To what? I, I said this before. I know there's been times when some of our girls felt, well, I don't really feel like I fit in everywhere. Well, go to Walmart. You can pretty much do whatever you want now. You can be a cat or a dog or a hippopotamus. I've never heard anybody say I identify as a hippopotamus. You know? I identify as retired, but for some reason Social Security has not kicked in yet. I just need to get them the letter. You know, my husband identifies as invisible. He's transparent. We have to understand this world we live in is so confused, so chaotic. If I think or I feel like I want to do something, I'm just going to go and do it. Forget the consequences. Forget who it hurts. Well, it's my choice, my right. I can do doesn't matter. There's always someone else who's going to pay the price for your sin, for my sin. We may not see it. We may not, we, you might not even believe that. It's still true. We have to know. Um, and these churches that are, you know, seemingly, and it's not really true, growing, who are just trying to, you know, celebrate everything all the time, there's no depth. They have a crowd, but they don't have a congregation. You know, that's why when, we, when I started, I said, I'm so thankful for a pastor that teaches truth. I'm so thankful for a pastor that says, ask me questions. Ask me questions. You don't understand something? Come ask me questions. You can sit all day long, and he will. He, he was here uh, a couple days ago, met with two people. Did you get done what you needed to get done? No, but I gave them both a Bible study. And they just kept asking questions. I'm like, okay. <laughs> that was the most important thing. But this is a church that says, yeah, if you don't understand something, come and ask me. Ask questions. Understand it. Get deep into the word of God. Spend time reading. I tell my high school students, especially, if you read a passage in your, in your lessons and you don't understand it, read it again. Sometimes you have to read something over and over and over again. Myself, personally, I will read a passage of Scripture, then I listen to it several days in a row. And then I'll read another passage of Scripture, and then I'll listen to it. Why? Because you catch things you didn't catch the first few times. We need to get the word of God into our spirit, into our mind. We spend more time on social media, video games, t TV shows, movies, entertaining books, or whatever it is you do than we do in this word. That's problematic. We have got to have some depth to our relationship. We made a covenant relationship with God. We've got to have some depth to it. The basic principle is love. It was love that this covenant was in, uh, initiated by God in the first place. And by love, the people were to maintain their close relationship with God. In the book of Deuteronomy, it wasn't like a fairy tale or Hollywood 
love. It was a selfless, loyal love established in the context of covenant. If you see a couple that have married, been married for 30 years, that was a choice. That was a choice. I guarantee you in those 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, there was some struggles. But they made some choices. If they did every day what they felt like doing, they may not have stayed married. But they chose to build relationship. And that's what God is desiring from you. You are his bride. I am his bride. We are his bride. He wants us to choose to this relationship. In the gospel of Luke, Jesus introduced a new covenant to the apostles at the Last Supper. He said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. What more could he give? God robed himself in flesh to pour out his own life's blood so he could destroy evil and protect us in the process. Think about that. He loves you so much. He's not asking you to die. He's asking you to live for him. The Jewish apostles and the first century leaders of Luke's gospel would likely be reminded of the covenantal commitment in Exodus. Then the, he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And when Moses read the book of the covenant, the people affirmed the covenant with a commitment to obedience, thus taking up their part to the contract. The sacrificial blood of the animals ratified the contract, thus Christ by speaking of his blood in this connection. So in the Old Testament, it was the blood of an animal. In the New Testament, it was the blood of Jesus that signified that. You know, back in old tribal days, you know, men would drink each other's blood and be blood brothers. And some of you as kids would, you know, cut a little poke on your finger and you know, do the, yeah, don't do that. That's gross. But they understood what that blood represented. He has made a commitment to us. And what we need to do is make a commitment to him. God becomes human flesh. He offered himself because he wants to destroy the evil in this world and protect us in the process. That's beautiful. We don't deserve it. Anyone in here never sin? Really, no, stand. <laughs> we don't deserve it, but his blood has made it possible. Um, if we understand that the new covenant would succeed where the old covenant failed. It enables people to be obedient to God from, from the heart so that we can have a relationship with him. So there are some things in the Bible that might be challenging for you to be obedient to. That's where the Holy Ghost comes in. He said, I'm going to send the comforter to help you, to guide you, to lead you in all truth. I know people who, who are so addicted to some things they couldn't get out of it on their own, but when they were baptized in the name of Jesus and filled with the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden they didn't have to do it by themselves. He helps us. In our, in our weaknesses, he's strong. You may say, you know, I really like doing this sin, and I have my pet sin over here, and the things I like to do over there, and the things I like to look at and watch and listen to, and the things I like to talk about, and the disobedience here. These, these are little, and, and no one ever needs to know, and pastor won't ever find out. The church doesn't need to see that. But he's like, if, you, if you'll just give those things to me, I will help you walk out of it. I will make you victorious, and they will no longer control you. See, it blows my mind sometimes. People are like, well, I don't want to be controlled. The government's not going to control me. My parents aren't going to control me. My spouse isn't going to control me. But you'll let sin control you. You'll let sin control your life. And the difference between your parents or your spouse or the church giving you direction and trying to guide you in the right way is that sin will not only control you, it will destroy your life. Well, I haven't seen it yet, but you will. If you live long enough, you're going to see it. You're going to see it. And if you die in your sin, that's when there's no hope. If you can take a breath today, you got breath in your lungs, there's still hope. There's still hope. So Jesus spoke of the new covenant in terms of the new birth in John chapter 3. He said, Nicodemus, you want to be part of this new covenant? You got to be born again. 
You know the story. We've talked about it before. You need to be born of the water and of the spirit. Those are Jesus' words. You've got to be born of the water and of the spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. You can't even see it, Nicodemus, until you've been born of the water and of the spirit. It talks about covenant and marriage. Um, in 2 Corinthians, Paul spoke of the new covenant as, as, as a marriage thing. Do you have 2 Corinthians 11 too? It says, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. We are his bride. And I appreciate Sister Seaver's uh, lessons in our ladies group. She's been talking a lot about that. When we stand before him as the bride of Christ, he will not have to say, depart from me, you that work iniquity, I never knew you. We will see the sin on our own dress. We will see the flaws in our own garment. And if it's not covered by the blood of Christ, he won't have to tell us that we're not, we didn't make it. We'll know. We'll know. It's not going to be a shock. <gasps> what do you mean? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And, I, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. That word means it's that intimacy. He wants an intimate relationship with us. It's not enough just to come to church. You might volunteer 20 hours a day working here, doing things, fixing things, all important. Do that. If you've got a couple hours this week you can give, do that. That's important. We all have to work together, just like at your house. You hope everyone helps out. If mama works outside the home, everybody should do a little bit. If mama works inside the home, everybody should still do a little bit, right? We all need to pull together to make it work. But that's not what saves us. What saves us is relationship. He wants you to have a relationship. And when you start building your relationship with Jesus, all of a sudden your desires will start to change. Those things that are sinful that you're doing, you won't want to do those things anymore. You won't be craving those sins. You know, they tell me if I stop drinking, you know, sugary drinks and only drink water, that eventually I won't crave sugary drinks anymore. If I start seeking after Jesus, start reading his word, spending time in prayer, I don't have to worry about the sin. I'm just going to keep focused on him, and he's going to lead me and guide me away from that sin. Amen? The recognition of grace doesn't justify sin. And I have run out of time, so I'm going to stop here. But I want to encourage you, sacrificial living means you're seeking him. You're pursuing him. He's pursuing you constantly because he loves you. Let's stand. But we've got to pursue him by spending time in his word, by praying, by building that relationship with him. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your love and for your mercy and for your grace.